at the University of Michigan, particularly students interested in topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the deadline for that application is October 12th. So I'm taking this opportunity to point this out to you. And if you know of interested students who are getting ready to apply for graduate school this fall, they might find this all expenses paid three-day trip of interest. I can talk more about that if anyone is particularly interested. Um, as a thank you for the kind introduction. So a lot of the work I'm going to talk about was sort of wrapping up uh, in Zurich with uh, my research group there, and in particular Adam Amara, Sebastian uh, Dangen, Sasha Kvantz, and Madalena Reggiani, but also these large uh, programs that we were involved with uh, from our group at the ETH, the Sphere Instrument GTO Team Survey, 250 nights on the VLT from ESO, and uh, the Planet S collaboration in Switzerland, and I'll try to point out the other colleagues relevant. However, I am now at the University of Michigan, and we're building up our group in uh, formation and evolution of planetary systems. So check that out if you're interested in the wider range of what we're up to. This is the chart of the outcomes that we need to explain with any predictive theory of planet formation. Um, this is the familiar planet mass versus orbital separation plot. The planet masses are in Earth masses, and the distances are in astronomical units. So there's a wide range of colors on this plot. The open circles are radial velocity detections. This is from a few years ago. It's not the current plot. The orange circles are transit observations that have been, uh, for which dynamical masses were obtained through radial velocity. Surveys, the green dots are timing variations. The purple dots are microlensing. And this cloud of light blue objects, if you download an exoplanet catalog, will say these are directly imaged planets. I dispute that. Um, I think there's a wide range of objects that are collected in that bag from such a catalog. And I will try to motivate the ratio of the object, the companion object, to the star mass as a useful discriminant between, say, a brown dwarf companion and a planet, and maybe separation as well. So in my book, there's only about 10 or 12 objects that you would legitimately claim could have been formed from planet-like processes. And I'll have to explain that to you. Um, if we take a phenomenological approach to various theories of gas giant planet formation, you would core accretion models generally would predict smaller planets forming closer to their host star, and gravitational instability would predict forming larger planets farther from their host star. And this is sort of the hot spot for the moment, if you will, the place where habitable planets could be found around very late type stars, very interesting in the moment for obvious reasons, with uh, Trappist and Proxima b. Um, but gas giants are still important and relevant. Uh, they may be needed to deliver volatiles inside a zone that could support liquid water on the surface of a solid body. Just because something is in the habitable zone doesn't mean it's habitable. It needs the volatiles. And there are questions in formation theory about how those volatiles can be retained through the classic processes of planet formation. So our story begins with Andrew Cumming in 19, uh, 2008 where uh, years of radial velocity surveys had accumulated and some nice uh, power law fits were made to the extant planet populations within two or two and a half AU. We fit power laws, that's no surprise, and we tried to predict different planet frequencies for different kinds of surveys built around a formalism like this. So the planet distribution functions are rising in surface density in the log, and they are rising to smaller masses in the log, but even more dramatically in linear units. So that's a starting point. And when we started 10, 15 years ago, maybe 20, with our first uh, adaptive optics supported surveys in Arizona, we would take models based on this distribution and predict what we would see beyond 30 AU. And of course, if it's rising and it just keeps rising, there's going to be a lot of planets out there. So our null results were about cutting off those distribution functions at some outer cutoff radius. Rather pathetic, but uh, something that one can do. So that's kind of what we did. Um, something else that's disturbed me, even when we first started doing that, was that we know that there are binary companions to stars, and they have a certain orbital distribution function, and they have a certain companion mass ratio distribution. And if we extrapolate those companion distribution functions over the range of parameter space where we're sensitive, say 2 to 30 Jupiter masses, over separation ranges from 20, in the most optimistic case, out to hundreds of AU, any object we might find could either be a very low mass brown dwarf companion or 
a planet formed from planet-like processes in a circumstellar disk. So it seems sensible to combine those two phenomenological models to make predictions for our surveys. A key thing that we have assumed in this work is that the companion mass ratio distribution does not depend on separation. That is almost certainly wrong. Uh, it must break down at, at some levels, but, and we've looked pretty hard for evidence, quantitative evidence that it does break down, at least for the companion mass ratio distribution of binaries, we believe that is robust. At least we haven't seen any evidence for that. And in the planet distributions, maybe there's some structure around 1AU in the gas giant RV data, maybe not, and that really needs to be investigated. But it's an assumption I'm going to make. Yes, I won't call it that, but I might use the term to explain what I think it is to other people. <laughs> So indeed, the next chart is basically about that. So we've built this uh, uh, you know, DN uh, population for both the planets as a function of separation and, dis and mass, and the log normal companion surface density distribution with a companion mass ratio distribution. That companion mass ratio distribution seems to be universal between cohorts of A stars, FGK stars, and M dwarfs. We've tested that for various populations of binary surveys, and we have a series of papers that explores that. We also searched for variations with separation and don't see evidence of that. Q is the ratio of the brown dwarf companion to the star mass. Yes, so we basically assume the brown dwarfs are an extension of the binary star populations that we know and love that are well characterized. The log normal Rogdevon distribution function, for example, and a relatively flat companion mass ratio distribution. Here we get a, a value for Q of about 0.25, plus or minus 0.25, but a flat companion mass ratio distribution. And then we extrapolate that down into two Jupiter masses, point, which we use the opacity. using the power law. at a lot more low mass companions and they didn't see them. And that kind of got stuck, at least in my head. Many other people always assumed a flat companion mass ratio distribution. And then we looked at this and said, well, there are no brown dwarf companions because there aren't, there's no there there. You know, in Q, that real estate is very, very small. So this function just drops. When you add it with the binaries, of course, there's a local minimum. And this has been seen, and maybe Scott is referring to this, in radial velocity surveys, Salman the, from the Geneva group published a very nice result, which sees this local minimum in the distribution uh, between 20 and 40 Jupiter masses. The data that we've collected on brown dwarf binaries and these planet searches are consistent with that, but you could also guess they're consistent with a lot of other things. I don't want to draw too much, but we explore this in, in Madalena's paper from last year. So that's the brown dwarf desert, such as it is. Um, I don't think it's a desert, which to me implies a dearth of something expected. It's just a local minimum. Yes. I, I agree, and that is really what we need to be doing now to decide exactly how ro robust the local minimum is, how deep it is, and how uncertain it really is, because all of them have error bars. That's absolutely right. It, well, I guess one way of characterizing it, I got sort of annoyed that everybody was collecting all these exoplanet surveys and not finding anything. Well, this was constraining the brown dwarf companion mass ratio distribution, and I thought that was worth exploring. So we set about doing that, and uh, uh, as I said, we assumed these binary star surveys. We normalized them, at least to the surveys that were, had been done. This was from a sample of stars that we selected for our Spitzer program a number of years ago. This is the assumption, which still needs to be tested. And lo and behold, we're, we set about trying to determine cutoff radii for various values of that power law. 
I, I'm a little dismissive of it because I'm a little embarrassed by the whole process. But um, you fit the power law to the, to, to, you fit an exponent to the power law and some cutoff radius, and there are, there are a million ways you can explain the null results that people find, or the handful of planets that are detected. But it's not uncommon for people to, for reason, good reasons, but not strong reasons, to select, put a prior on their uh, power law exponent and then claim some 90% confidence that the cutoff is at 50 AU or smaller. And that's barely at a place where we can image with 8 meter telescopes with adaptive optics. Because we're only sensitive down to maybe two Jupiter masses, and we know there's a, a zoo of objects if we can get below you know, half a Jupiter mass, but we're, we still have a ways to go to get there. Uh, Brendan Bowler put together a nice summary of the state of the field here uh, last year. So this is the frequency of 5 to 13 Jupiter mass planets on wide orbits, find in various ways here, for different stellar samples. And the bottom line is there aren't very many planets out beyond 30 AU. And it might not have been surprising to those of you who study planet formation. There's just not that much stuff out there. It's hard to do core accretion uh, out there, et cetera, et cetera. But we do seem to find that there's a, a hint that the frequency of gas giants might depend on stellar mass. So higher mass stars tend to have bigger planets, perhaps also farther out. And that's something we're still in the process of exploring. But these null results in these upper limits are not very impressive, so it's hard to see a real signal here. But nonetheless, averaging over all stars, it still seems like the A and B stars have a higher frequency of gas giants at large separations. So as a prequel to a survey that was planned with one of the next generation high contrast imaging experiments called Sphere, where I mentioned we were awarded 250 nights to build the instrument, um, we did a survey with an L and M band imager in the thermal infrared called NACO. And basically, we were cleaning up stellar samples as best we could. We added about 80 stars and then downloaded another 1 to 200 stars from extant databases to try to build a sample approaching 200, maybe 250 stars. Again, we didn't see anything. What is shown here is an is a attempt, a very preliminary attempt, at a population synthesis model from gravitational instability from Forgan and Rice. And they form planets liberally through their massive disks. They're wildly unstable at large orbital separations, predict masses in orbital separations, and then go so far as to allow some planet-planet scattering to occur, kicking things out into larger orbits where it'd be trivial to see them. We then just convolve some outcomes of their models with our sensitivity curves for our sample. And lo and behold, if gravitational instability had been a major channel for gas giant planet formation at large orbital radii, we should have seen dozens of objects. We didn't see any. So we conclude that gravitational instability, while surely happens sometimes, is not a major channel for gas giant planet formation at large orbital radii. And I just wanted to highlight, since I'm here, that the uh, uh, not exactly the same analysis, but a kind of a, a conclusion in a similar sense was, was done by Brandt on the SEED survey, just pointing out that the objects you do discover, th that mass function is kind of weighted to top heavy things, more like a, a, a companion mass ratio distribution for binary brown dwarfs, not planet distributions. OK, so back to uh, this power law and my embarrassment with it. I'm seeing a function that's rising, and then it's falling. And so I think to myself, surely a power law with a sharp cutoff, there have to be other explanations for that. So why not a log normal? And you know, we're inspired by the log normal. The IMF is a log normal. Um, the companion mass ratio, the, the surface density of stellar binary companions is log normal. Or basically, it's flat, I guess is another way to say that. And it ends somewhere. So why not try to fit a log normal to the surface density of gas giant planets? Can we do that? Well, it turns out we can, but only for a special sample, the M dwarfs. And be, it's because the sweet middle, uh, where the Einstein ring is sensitive to planets, covers this important range from 1 to 8 AU. And that's a, a wonderful result that we can, we assume that the microlensing host stars are M dwarfs. Several of them are confirmed. That's a good assumption, I think, but that is an assumption of this analysis. But because of the M dwarfs have that extra data point, this is a really interesting thing to study, I believe. So we did that. We took point estimators for a bunch of M dwarf exoplanet frequencies around uh, low mass stars and just did a maximum likelihood analysis on the, these point estimators with their error bars. So let me explain this plot. The PDFs are shown here, the differential PDFs along the ordinate on the right hand side. And if you integrate these curves 
over the range of the measurements. So this is not an error bar, but it's a range of a survey. You get these point estimators on the left-hand side. So the F values integrated over these ranges. I've integrated our MLE for this fit. And those red Xs are the predictions of this model, if you will. And these black dots are the measurements from the different surveys and their uncertainties. So this was Bowler's upper limit. This was a nice uh, work from the Grenoble group on M dwarfs, the Lanier et al. survey. This is the microlensing data, which I claimed was so important. And then a long-term trend analysis from the RV work uh, shown here from Montet et al. And this is the Bonfils uh, radial velocity survey for M dwarfs. So it goes up and it comes down. Now that fit is not in the red curve is our fit or a maximum like we maximize the likelihood that these data came from a log normal. And how does that compare with the binary with the log normal? Yes, it fits rather well. The mean that our later mean is different. It's at slightly smaller separations, but it's certainly consistent with the range of the mean for the M dwarfs. This is the current model that most people use, which is the power law with the cutoff. And I don't want to disparage it because, in fact, formally, it's just as good a fit to these data as the, as the red line. So that tells you where data starved. Maybe point estimators isn't the way to go. I actually have you know, uh, orbital separations for all of the data points in the survey, so I could do a better job of this on an object-by-object -object basis. And we're going to do that. But for the moment, we thought we'd put this log normal is at least as good a fit, if not a better fit. I'll point out that these detections out here are actually beyond tens of AU, so I'm not sure the blue fit can, can survive them. But in any case, they're the work of Clanton and Gowdy, which is really wonderful and, 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 and very carefully done, um, doesn't include that latest survey. And that's their fit. So here's the waterfall plot for, those, uh, for that fit. The mean is reasonably well constrained. Uh, we have a horrible degeneracy between sigma and the amplitude. Uh, and the sigma is basically not constrained at all really test whether this is a better fit or not. So we should work on that. And again, it's fully consistent with the frequencies estimated. It, the, the one thing we can really get a handle on is the overall frequencies when you marginalize over all of our uncertainties. So here's the frequency of 1 to 10 Jupiter mass planets around M dwarfs over the range of 10 to 1,000 AU. It's about 2%. So if you're going to look for them, you need a sample of hundreds of stars and you know, hope for the best. But that's the integrated F value couple percent. You may remember that the A and B star percent were varied from 4 to 8. So again, we're getting an answer that is consistent with the idea that the overall gas giant frequency is depending on stellar mass. And that's true and that's known. Uh, John Johnson pointed that out. Brendan Bowler did some more work. Several people have pointed out that you can't square everything that we've seen as a function of stellar mass with a single exoplanet population. There's clearly some dependence. Whether that is on the normalization factor or the planet mass function is unclear. For if you thought that gas giants formed more efficiently around higher mass stars, the data are consistent with that. If you thought that the efficiency is about the same, but that the planet mass function was tilted relative to the stellar mass, the data are consistent with that too. And we need to sort that out. So how could we sort that out? Now here's my kind of busy plot where I attempt to motivate how we could do that. All right. Sorry, it's not projecting well. The green curve is my combined model of exoplanet companions and brown dwarf companions for G stars. Green for G stars. And they're exactly the same curves in each right and left hand plot. What varies is whether I take the stellar mass dependence, M dwarfs in red, A and B stars in black, if I scale the planet population with efficiency, linearly with stellar mass, I move this curve up and down on the left-hand side. If I scale the planet mass function relative to the stellar mass, I slide the planet part left and right on the right-hand side. So the local minimum moves, but also the overall frequencies are adjusting too. I've added in you know, unnecessary complexity by arguing that there's a cutoff due to the opacity limit for fragmentation of my brown dwarfs, and all of my planets are limited by a tenth of the star mass because circumstellar disks don't get bigger than 10% of the star mass. So that's where those little discontinuities come in. I'm sorry for that. It just makes the plots messier. There's real reasons for them, but they, you know, it's a bit hand-waving. 
So generally, in the model where the exoplanet efficiency scales with stellar mass, you have a huge range uh, between M dwarfs and A and B stars. Here, the ranges are similar, and the local minima don't move so much. So you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm impatient, so I would like to know the answer. And again, uh, luckily, M dwarfs at least have an interesting database. These are the microlensing results over all mass ranges plotted now in Q. So from Schwarzwald et al., 2016. So just a sniff or a hint that that local minimum doesn't move very much as a function of stellar mass. And that would be a bit more consistent with the idea that the planet mass function scales with stellar mass for gas giants. And I'll just here of the, the, the punchline. We know that breaks down for very, very low mass planets where there's a much higher frequency of terrestrial and super Earths around M dwarfs. So there's a very different thing going on here between these gas giant populations. And that, I think, finding out where that breaks is really the interesting question to be focused on. They do, but people who know more than I, at least for the transit case, debate whether they've done that properly or not. My understanding, J Josh knows a million times more about this than I, but the M dwarfs that exist in the Kepler catalog were sort of thrown in in a rather ad hoc and complicated way to assess what the biases are. But most people who seem to know believe there's, that's still a robust result, that there's a higher frequency of small things around M dwarfs than FGK stars. But more work needs to be done. Jump in if I misspeak. So um, to date, uh, we have a local minimum in the companion mass ratio distribution, which I would argue helps us to distinguish the like, you know, any one object you never know, but the likelihood that an object on either side of that local minimum is more likely to have been a brown dwarf binary or form perhaps from planet-like processes, whatever I mean by that. GI is not the dominant channel of gas giant planet formation. The surface density distribution of M dwarfs is consistent with a log normal, so I think we should explore that uh, further. And this dependent of the giant planet mass function may depend on the star uh, planet mass ratio. So my basic argument is that we need multiple surveys over a broad range of stellar mass. And of course, we're doing that the best we can, but we've got more work to do, which I'll describe now a few of the surveys that are ongoing, and then end with some uh, predictions for what we could do with the future facilities. So I mentioned we're doing this survey, 200 night survey with the ESO VLT. Uh, it's called Shine. This is an example of our completeness limits for a typical source in our first 100 star sample. We're going to publish a statistical analysis of the first 100 new stars. And then by the end of the survey, it'll about, be about 250 to 300 stars in our final FGK star sample. So if you compare that to thermal infrared imaging uh, with existing uh, uh, this, so this is a shorter wavelength, typically around 1, 1 to, point, 1 to 1.5 microns. This is 3 to 5 micron. It's a little bit of a cheat comparison because it's on similar samples of stars. With this technique, you can go to older stars where the planets are colder, and you could do much better by optimizing your survey for nearer older by stars, which hasn't been done here. And that's something I'm very passionate about, is doing this work in the thermal infrared. We're getting about the same planet mass, because this is not a terrible technique, but we're getting to smaller inner working angles with sphere on the ESO VLT. Uh, we discovered something. So if you missed it over the summer, I just wanted to spend a minute pointing this out to you. We discovered a planetary mass object around this uh, Hipparchos uh, A star in the uh, lower Centaurus Crux subgroup of the SCOS NOB association. The star is about two solar masses. Its parameters are listed here. The companion is about 5 to 10 Jupiter masses. has a temperature of about 12 to 1400 degrees. Uh, so it's a dusty, young L dwarf, like many of the directly imaged planetary mass objects. The masses are uncertain because they're relying on theoretical models that are not well calibrated. But we did succeed, so we're very happy about that. Uh, it's not a background star. It has a spectrum that is consistent with uh, its status as a low gravity young object. And there's the detection images uh, that you can see there. Let's see, is there anything else I did? Oh, I should say a little bit more about the star. Know the star, know the planet. Um, it's 120 parsecs away. It's 10 to 20 million years old. Curiously, it has no evidence for a debris disk. 
that we can see at all, and that it, many of the other young image planets seem to be more associated with debris disks. This is a troubling number. Uh, we tried to do a careful job, but it's hard to estimate B sine i for early type stars with um, uh, low gravity. So there's some uncertainty here, but it's very fast. It's not above breakup, but it's awfully close, and it's the fastest rotating early A star in SCOSEN. So I'm troubled by that. I should put a colon after that fact and not an exclamation point. Well, it, you know, if you, if you try to measure the V sine i and just look at this whole cohort, um, it, it's very much an outlier. So, you know, it's not physically troubling, but maybe there's something interesting in there, maybe not. Maybe it has something to do with its odd evolutionary history related to the planet. That would be exciting. But I would have preferred it was a more normal member of lower Centaurus crux. So here are data points, these little dots with their error bars. These three lines are models from various atmospheric models with various uncertain cloud properties sort of stuck in. And these are template spectra of actual low gravity planetary mass objects in various young regions. So that's our spectrum, and it's consistent with a low, a young, uh, dusty L object. Um, this uh, plot I find a little more interesting. It's the mass ratio of the companions to the planet for everything in the exoplanet database is a function of orbit. So again, here is my interest of objects below 0.01 in the ratio of the planet mass to the star mass. And I've noted everything sort of here inside of 100 AU. So these are sort of the interesting planetary mass companions, I think. And that's our object right there for this sample. Obviously, a 10 Jupiter mass object has a different meaning around a 0.1 solar mass star than it does around a 3 solar mass star, at least to me. So we need more. This is going to, you know, you ask a time allocation committee for 200 nights to do an FGK star survey, you come up with 10 planets or something. You know, and then you say, I need to do an M-dwarf survey. And it's going to take even longer because they're so faint. You know, It's a bit rough. So we need to be diverse in the tools that we use for this. NearCam on JWST. Uh, that's coming. A little bit of a slip, but you know, I can wait. I've been waiting 20 years. What's six more months? Um, as part of the NearCam GTO team, we've planned a kind of a mini pilot 16 of the nearest, youngest M-dwarfs. Faint primaries are a really sweet spot for direct imaging with JWST. In the strong contrast limit, I think it's arguable that ground-based extreme AO will be as good or better than the contrast you'll get with the James Webb Space Telescope. And I say that as a fan of direct imaging and JWST. Um, so if you find faint primaries and you get into the background limit at the smallest inner working angle you can, the game is over. Nothing on the ground will ever touch the James Webb Space Telescope in the background limit. So if you can get there around nearby, very faint primaries, you can get down to a tenth of a Jupiter mass, you know, like that. Yeah, it's not quite like that, but um, we, if there are Uranus and Neptune-sized uh, objects out at 20 and 30 AU around the very nearest M dwarfs, we will see them with JWST. There'll be no problem. And that would be a huge discovery. I've only got 16 objects. So I'm banking on the fact that that planet mass function is screaming as we get down this way to compensate for the fact that I've only got 15 objects. And of course, we'd like a you know, 100 orbit project with this to do a proper M-dwarf survey. So if you serve on the JWST TAC, watch for that and approve it when it comes your way. Um, the other fun experiment we could do is crank it up the other side and look at B stars. Um, B stars are hard to do radial velocity surveys of, but there's been some interesting work on K, uh, G and K giants, as many of you know, the retired A stars, if you will. And I don't know how, how much play this Refert et al. paper from the Lande Sternwarte in Heidelberg has gotten here in North America, but they claim they haven't detected a single RV gas giant candidate above about three solar masses. Now, you know, there are error bars, and this is hard, and so I'm not sure how strong that hard upper limit is. But it's interesting. And if we can test it in another way, I think that would be fun. Um, so more work to be done on RVs to verify that result. But if that result were true, you might wonder whether that was because gas giants that formed around those B stars didn't migrate in fast enough before the disk dissipated. So are there a bunch of stranded gas giants around B stars? And by the way, I said before that you know, higher mass stars, higher mass planets, so maybe a B star survey is an interesting thing to do. 
So using the models I described to you, we ran the Monte Carlo simulation. And indeed, you sort of pick up about 50% more B star, uh, planets around a B star sample than an FGK sample for the model where the planet mass function scales with stellar mass. If you assume the efficiency scales with stellar mass, this thing would be off the charts here. And I don't believe that model myself, but we, we proposed for a large survey of B stars in SCOSEN to try to test this. So we'll see if we get the time or not. You can make arguments uh, based on the viscous time. Uh, so it goes as r squared divided by nu, and depending on what you put in for the sound speed and the orbital uh, Kepler frequency, you, know, you can argue that the, the migration time scale should go as the radius of the planet. And if the radius of the planets are forming around the ice line, that's li also linearly dependent on star mass. And by the way, circumstellar disks live shorter amounts of time around uh, higher mass stars, inversely proportional to the mass, sorry. Basically, there's a 10 time greater chance of stranding a planet around a B star compared to an F, uh, G star, at least in my world. OK, so to wrap up, um, there are still many questions. Uh, one thing I've sort of glossed over is this issue of what is the planet mass function. There are, there, this is a refereed paper. <laughs> Andrew Howard from the, from the RV survey of the California Carnegie Group does claim there's an there's a uptick in the frequency of gas giants at a certain point below about a half a Jupiter mass. And this paper from the Geneva group that is still not refereed or accepted, it's on the archive, it has 350 citations, but it's not been accepted yet. Michelle's retired, long referees report, I don't know, six years later. But they also claimed an uptick in the frequency. So is it a power law or is it a broken power law? And if it's a broken power law, is it a log normal? You know, how many breaks in a power law are you comfortable with? So maybe we should be exploring some other functional dependencies of the planet mass function. And again, I said before, whatever little phenomenology you do here with these gas giants, you have to break it when you get down to the rocky things because it's a completely different ballgame. And finding that switching point, that's this point, is a really, really, to me, kind of the central thing I could like to focus on in the next few years, figure out how to make progress on that. Is the surface density of gas giants log normal or power law? I think that'll be easy. We'll clean that up very soon. Um, and does that peak depend on stellar mass? This is a complicated formation story, but also migration, which is a super complicated uh, convolution of the initial formation locations. And this is my Achilles heel. And everything I've told you will really get super complicated if I allow planet mass functions to vary with orbital separation, which certainly they do. But we're still mapping out these spaces and doing kind of first or zeroth order work on this. And I'll just close by reminding everybody, probably don't need to, that we need ELTs. Uh, ELTs have a unique combination of sensitivity and angular separation. And here, the game is more about angular separation. Because I told you, JWST will cremate anything on the ground in the background limit. But all of these planets are inside of 30 AU, you know, all of them. And we really need these behemoths, first of all, will detect objects of known mass. Gaia will already give us a sample. We've got RV ones. We know that there'll be dozens to hundreds of objects of known dynamical masses for which we'll get spectra and photometry. And that will close the loop on all of our evolutionary models and calibrate the input physics to uh, three decimal places. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, for me, in this demographic story, these large telescopes will get over the peaks of those surface density distributions. So we will really join hands with the RV community, with ELT. I sound like a snake oil salesman that you've heard this for 20 years, but really, it will really happen with ELTs. We'll really get there. We'll also be able to sample the break in the exoplanet mass function and empirically determine whether these mass functions depend on orbital separation. And I'll leave that for lunch. And that's it.